Greetings, this is Greg. I want to talk about the design, performance, and combat record of the Kawasaki Ki-61. Before we get into those things, we need to quickly go over the different variants of this plane because there are several distinct versions of this thing and with very different performance levels and combat history. Furthermore, some of the variants look so much alike that there's a lot of confusion out there about these planes, and even more so when reading through the documents of the war because misidentification was quite common. Let's start with the Kawasaki Ki-60. It's not a Ki-61, it's a different airplane and never went into production. However, it had the same designer, used the same engine, and looks similar, thus is often confused with the Ki-61. There were very few Ki-60s. In fact, I think everyone ever built is on screen in this picture, so for the purposes of this video, you can now put it out of your mind. By the way, it's spelled K-I, but pronounced Ki. I don't know why the person translating this from Japanese didn't just spell it K-E-E, -E, but that's what we have. Apologies in advance for mispronouncing any Japanese stuff in this video. Next up, we have the Ki-61 Model 1. These names are a bit confusing. I'll call this version the Dash 1, as that's how it's normally written. Ki-61, then a Dash, then the 1. The Japanese named it the Hein, which means Flying Swallow. This is the version that represents the vast majority of Ki-61s built, over 80% of them. This is the version we will be focusing on in this video. Keep in mind there are several sub-variants that differ mostly in armament. I should also point out that this plane is sometimes called the Type 3. That's a general term for all Ki-61s, having to do with the year in which it was released. Sort of like Mitsubishi's A6M being the Type 0, the Nakajima Ki-43 being Type 1, and the Nakajima Ki-44 being Type 2, and so on. The Ki-61s are Type 3s, so just don't think it's a third version of the Ki-61. Next up, we have the Ki-61-2 KAI. KAI just means modified. It's an abbreviation for a Japanese word. There was a plain Dash 2, but it was a prototype. The production version was the Dash 2 KAI. This is a different airplane from the Dash 1, but it looks almost identical. It has a different engine, a longer fuselage usually. The longer fuselage was shared with some Dash 1s. The Dash 2s had more wing area and numerous other differences. The Dash 1 and Dash 2 KAI are about as different as the BF-109E versus a BF-109G, maybe even a little bit more so. Telling the Dash 1 and Dash 2 apart in combat or when looking at a grainy wartime photograph is very difficult. This museum airplane is a Dash 2. All of the Dash 2s I have seen have a canopy aft of the cockpit that is visually distinctive compared with the Dash 1. The Dash 1 airplanes have the canopy meet the fuselage at the rear at a different angle than the Dash 2. That's the best way I've found to tell them apart, but I can't be sure there wasn't some sort of overlap of canopy types during the production run. Also, apparently all Dash 2s don't have a retractable tailwheel, probably a result of the fuselage stretch, which again was shared with some Dash 1, so that's not a reliable way to tell them apart. Plus, it's very hard to see that extra length in the pictures. It's only about 7 inches. Production changes in World War II airplanes did not always take place on a cut-and-dry timeline. And with the Japanese airplanes, it's very, very hard to pinpoint exactly when some of these changes happened. The point here is that you have to be very careful when you're looking at U.S. reports from World War II on this airplane. Because for the most part, pilots had no idea which variant they were looking at and often pictures of these planes are mislabeled. Now at some point in January of 1945, the U.S. Army Air Force bombed the factory when, where the Japanese were building the engines for the Ki-61-2s, leaving Kawasaki with 267 Ki-61s, which were complete except for their engines. With no more suitable inverted V-12s available, someone there got the bright idea of adapting an air-cooled radial engine to the unfinished Ki-61s. The team at Kawasaki had access to a German FW-190A model that was in Japan for some reason, and they took a look at the motor mount setup and the cowling and adapted that design 
to the Key 61, but with a homegrown Japanese radial engine. This was the very successful fighter called the Key 100, which is literally a Key 61-2 converted to use an air-cooled radial. These planes were literally built initially as Key 61-2s. Although you will see some Key 100s with bubble-type canopies. That was from the Key 61-3 prototype, which never went anywhere because obviously they didn't have the engines. The Key 100s had good performance and these were very threatening to U.S. fighters at the time. They were a little slower than the Key 61-2, but superior in most other ways. That's enough about the variants. Let's get into the design history of the Key 61-1. I think this airplane is one of the best looking fighters of World War II. It's a relatively streamlined airplane packing a supercharged liquid-cooled inverted V-12. Just looking at it, it doesn't really look like other Japanese airplanes from the period, and there are some specific reasons for that. At first glance, you might think the Key 61 is a German or Italian design. In fact, as seen in this U.S. intelligence report, it was thought that the Japanese were operating BF-109s in small numbers. This report predates the Doolittle Raid, and thus, during that raid, when a Key 61 was spotted, it was thought to be of German origin. Then, when U.S. pilots started to encounter them in combat, they were certain that they were fighting BF-109s. It wasn't until this gun camera footage was seen that it was determined that this was an Italian airplane, and it was given the code name Tony. The truth is, it's a homegrown Japanese design, but it does have a very strong German connection. And no, I'm not talking about the engine. Well, not just yet. I'll explain. After World War I, development of aircraft in Germany was seriously curtailed by the Treaty of Versailles. The result was that some German companies had their designs built in other countries and in some cases sent their engineers over to help out. One such German engineer was Richard Vogt, V-O-G-T. I don't have a picture of him, but he was a prominent designer for Dornier and went to Japan in the 1920s. During that decade, Kawasaki was building German designs. One of those was this Type 87 bomber, which was designed by Richard Vogt. While he was in Japan at Kawasaki, Vought trained a young Japanese engineer to be his successor. That engineer was this man, Takeo Doi. Uh, Doi is D-O-I, I guess that's how you pronounce it. Now, they worked together on various aircraft, including this Japanese biplane fighter. Notice it's liquid-cooled. Takeo Doi also spent 18 months in Europe studying aircraft engineering and design. Now, sometime after Vought went back to Germany, Takeo Doi designed the Kawasaki Key 61. So when we consider the designer's background, I don't think it's any mystery why the plane has a European appearance. The Key 61-1s were powered by the Kawasaki HA-40, a Japanese license-built version of Germany's Daimler-Benz DB601A. It's much like the engine used in most Messerschmitt BF-109Es from the Battle of Britain era. Comparing the DB601 with the Kawasaki HA40, or maybe it's HA40, I don't know, we find that the big numbers are all the same. It has the same bore and stroke, the same 33.9 liters of displacement. It also runs the same compression ratio of 6.9 to 1, which was pretty high for a supercharged aero engine of the time. Both use direct injection. Yes, the Japanese built the direct injection system. Now, some sources say that the Kawasaki variant is a little bit lighter, but I have not found anything official that backs that up. The HA-40 does appear to have the passage for the central cannon, although that was never used in the Key 61. The supercharger may have been different between the German and Japanese variants here. Some sources say that the Kawasaki engine used a single-speed, single-stage supercharger. Others say it used a hydraulic clutch, like the one used on German, uh, Germany's DB-601. The U.S. Navy's report, after analyzing a captured Key 61-1, said that it used a, quote, engine-driven supercharger equipped with an automatic fluid clutch, unquote. As we know from that Navy report, that at least then some Key 61s had the fluid clutch, like a 109, and I think the, ma the vast majority of them probably did, I'll be using performance data for comparison using a Key 61 with the fluid clutch supercharger. 
The HA-40 has 1,159 horsepower. Flight Magazine published the horsepower of a DB-601A as used in the 109Es at 1,150, so pretty much the same. In fact, 1,150 is a very commonly published number for both engines. The problem for Kawasaki is that while 1,150-ish horsepower may have been just great in 1940, the Ki-61 didn't enter service until 1942 and wasn't really in combat until 1943, and by then it just didn't have enough power to be competitive with the latest planes from the United States. It was close, just not quite there. To figure out where the Tony fits into the performance picture with other fighters, we'll graph its speed versus the U.S. Army Air Force's frontline 1942 fighters, in other words, the fighters flying when the Ki-61 first came out. Thankfully, this is pretty easy to do. There's actually plenty of data from captured Ki-61s. I'll put my chart up here. As usual, the official charts will be at the end of this video, but this format is easier to do this comparison. In 1942, fighting against the U.S. Army Air Force in the Pacific meant, for the most part, fighting P-40Es and P-39D models. As you can see, in terms of speed, the Tony is right between the P-39 and the P-40. These three planes all have essentially identical maximum power numbers. 1150 for the U.S. planes, 1159 for the Tony, or 1150 depending on the source. Of course, the planes have different supercharger drives, so the power at specific altitudes varies a bit. But overall, these three planes are pretty darn close to each other in terms of speed. It is interesting, I think, that the P-39 is the fastest one here. I have a video about this, but a big part of the P-39's design was the mid-engine configuration, which was done largely for streamlining. Most people don't know that. They think it was done primarily to have that big cannon up there. Not the case. However, the prototype P-39s ended up having very high drag. I mean very high. Now, NACA came up with ways to clean it up, and Bell implemented most of those, and the result was that Bell put together a pretty slippery airplane for the time of its design. Hence, the P-39 is pretty fast with not a lot of horsepower. So, by 1942 standards, the Tony speed isn't too bad. However, newer, faster planes were coming onto the scene. Newer versions of P-39s and P-40s were getting faster all the time. Worse, during 1943, relatively large numbers of P-38 Lightnings were entering service with the USAAF in the Pacific Theater. So, let's add a P-38F onto our chart. As you can see, the P-38 is faster than the Tony everywhere, and a lot faster at high altitudes. These numbers might actually look a little low to you for a P-38 if you're familiar with that airplane. That's because these are for the F or G model, which were earlier models with relatively low power and inadequate intercooling. During the tests when they generated these performance numbers, they were having to pull the power back in order to keep the carb air temps in check. Thus, while these numbers are not examples of the best a P-38 F or G could do, they are probably realistic numbers for a P-38 F or G operating in the warm climate of New Guinea. In other words, even in a sort of worst case for the P-38, which is an early variant running into the limitations of its poor intercooling on a hot day, the Lightning is still much faster than the Tony. Before we move on, I want to add one more plane to this chart because I think it's interesting. The BF-109E, because it has essentially the same engine as the Tony. Since both planes have pretty much the same engine and the same amount of power, this really shows how much cleaner the Tony is aerodynamically than the 109E. Of course, this is a 1940 version of the 109 and certainly is not representative of a 1943 BF-109. I suppose this is one of the problems with building someone else's engine under license. Kawasaki acquired the blueprints for the DB-601, and they got a few actual engines, which were delivered by submarine in 1940. So by the time they got their version of the engine into production and into an airplane, it was already obsolete. By 1943 standards, the Ki-61 really didn't have enough horsepower. Still, it was one of the best performing airplanes in the Japanese inventory, and really the only one that stood a chance against the P-38. Now, don't get me wrong, if I have to choose between going into combat in a P-61, or correction, a Ki-61, 
or a P38. That's not a contest. It's going to be the Lockheed P38 Lightning every time. However, if I have to choose between a Key 43 Oscar or an A6M0, and I'm going up against a P38, then I'll take the Tony. Now let's compare a few more performance aspects, and you'll see that while the 38 is much faster, the Tony is at least in the game. Climb rate goes to the P38. The Lightning outclimbs the Tony at all altitudes and by a pretty good margin. The P38's rate of climb is better by 600 feet per minute at sea level and about 700 feet per minute at 25,000 feet. The Tony is close at about 13,000 feet, but even at its closest point, it's still 300 feet per minute behind in climb rate, and the Tony's moving forward at a much lower speed. The Lightning can easily outclimb the Tony and do it at a higher speed, thus gain a lot of distance on it while it's climbing away. Furthermore, some of the Tonys don't have a constant speed propeller. They use an older variable pitch design, and the pilot had to really be paying attention to that manually controlled prop pitch, which is very distracting in combat. In order to extract maximum performance from the engine, every time the pilot moves the throttle, he'll have to adjust the propeller pitch, and vice versa. If he moves the prop pitch, that affects the manifold pressure. That means taking your eye off the enemy plane and checking the engine gauges uh, is something you're going to have to do. And, I mean, unless you can tell the difference between 2700 RPM and 2900 RPM by sound, and that's very impressive if you can, but failure to keep the RPM within limits and the manifold pressure within limits can and will blow the engine or result in much lower performance. So this was a, a fairly intensive task to perform and critical, and you had to do it while you were dogfighting. Now, all the U.S. fighters by this point of the war had constant speed propellers. So this extra workload was not an issue for the P-38 Lightning. But Kawasaki licensed this engine configuration, the DV-601A, right before the Germans switched over to a constant speed prop, and that's just really unfortunate timing for the Japanese pilots. On the plus side, at least Kawasaki put the prop pitch control by the throttle where it belongs. It's not on the instrument panel like on a 109D or some of the E models. It's easier to manipulate it because of the way they set the cockpit up. Now, the Key 61 that was tested by the U.S. Navy was a Dash 1, and it did have a constant speed propeller. So either at some point in the production run, the planes came off the assembly line with constant speed props. They switched it over from variable speed. Or perhaps the planes were retrofitted after production. Sadly, a lot of information about the Tony is lacking, and Often sources from the period are contradictory, and we don't have enough pictures of the planes with reliable data to figure some of this out with absolute certainty. In fact, just try and find cockpits of the throttle quadrant of a Key 61 Tony in service. So, what we do know is that some Mark 1s had constant speed props, and some had variable pitch props, but the numbers and dates of each have eluded me. I suspect the vast majority had constant speed. I just can't prove that. Now, dive speed goes to the Key 61. The P-38 had some pretty serious dive limitations, especially from high altitudes where it was Mach number limited. The P-38 was limited to around 420 miles per hour, or about Mach 0.67, whichever came first. These are very low numbers, lower than any other frontline U.S. Army Air Force fighter and by a pretty large margin. The U.S. Navy, when they compared the performance of the Tony to various U.S. Navy types, and they suggested anti-Tony tactics for the different U.S. Navy fighters. And in that report, they clearly state that Hellcat pilots should not try to outdive the Tony. And the Hellcat was a very fast-diving airplane, even faster than the F-4U Corsair. So while I don't have exact dive speeds for the Tony, we can say with a pretty high level of certainty that it could outdive any U.S. Navy fighter and the P-38 Lightning. Interestingly, we do have dive speeds for that later Key 100, which was similar in construction, and it had a very high 850 km per hour limit, so you can take that for what it's worth. Let's talk about armor and protection. Unlike most other Japanese fighters, the Tony was very well armored. The back of the pilot seat was made from one half inch thick armor plate, that's about 13 millimeters, and there was a second plate protecting the pilot's head. That's slightly thicker than the armor used on most U.S. Army Air Force fighters. 
Some sources also state that the plate had armor under the pilot. I suspect that was the bottom of the seat. I think they armored the bottom of the seat, but information on that's sketchy also. It makes sense, though. If you're building a seat with an armored backrest and you need to have armor under the pilot also, I think you would just make the armor part of the seat at the bottom. Uh, the Tony also has armor for the radiator. Now, this was very unusual in World War II fighters. It's well known, of course, that liquid-cooled fighters have a significant vulnerability in their cooling system because even a small amount of damage from shrapnel or small-caliber bullets to that fragile radiator will cause a leak and eventually bring the airplane down. As the Tony was the only operational Japanese fighter to use liquid cooling, it seems that they took this risk a lot more seriously than most, and they added some armor there. The Tony also has self-sealing tanks. All of its internal fuel tanks are self-sealing. So in terms of overall protection, the Tony is maybe even slightly better than most U.S. Army Air Force fighters and about equal to the U.S. Navy fighters. However, when we factor in firepower, that doesn't mean the Tony has an advantage in protection over the P-38. The Lightning's firepower more than evens this out. Now, there were at least five different weapon configurations within the various Dash 1 Tonys. In fact, the weapons were the main difference between the Dash 1 subvariants. And I'm not going to get into the exact nomenclature like a 1B or a 1-C or any of that because none of the data on that is consistent. Uh, what we do know is that initially the plane had twin 12.7 millimeter machine guns mounted on the cowl and two wing-mounted 7.7 millimeter rifle caliber machine guns, one in each wing, in other words. It appears that very few planes were actually built this way, maybe only one. Now those 12.7 millimeter uh, machine guns are nominally 50 caliber, but they're a little bit less powerful than the US 50 cals. Now, then they switched out those rifle caliber guns, the 7.7s that are in the wings, for 12.7 millimeter units. And this is the second version, and it had four 12.7 millimeter machine guns, two cowl mounted, two wing mounted. Numbers are hard to come by, but this it appears that this was a fairly early and rare configuration also. Next, and this is interesting, they swapped out those wing guns for dual Mauser 151 20 millimeter cannons. Now these were the actual German cannons, not license built copies. They only had about 800 of them, so at most 400 airplanes were built in this configuration. This is a pretty meaningful amount of firepower. Those MG-151s were no joke, and this setup gave the Tony firepower that was on par with most of its adversaries. Uh, two 12.7s in the cowl, two 20mm cannons in the wings, and good cannons. Some sources call the Tonys with the German cannons uh, Key 61 KAIs, or maybe they pronounce it Kai. I find that KAI term is thrown around so much and so inconsistently among various sources that it's almost meaningless. Back to those cannons. With so few of them available, they ran out and had to put in something else. And they did, but this is a bit odd. They replaced the German 20 millimeters with 12.7 millimeter machine guns, so they put those back in the wings, which they had before they put in the German 20s. But then they replaced the cowl-mounted guns with the Japanese H05 20mm cannons. Uh, in design, this is similar to the U.S. Browning machine gun, but they fire a 20mm cannon shell that was a shortened version of the shell used by the Allied 20mm Hispanos. So their 50 cal was slightly less powerful than the American 50 cal, and their 20mm was slightly less powerful than a typical American or British 20mm, but they're still plenty powerful to do the job. Now, it appears when they went to this configuration, that is the 12.7s uh, in the wings and the Japanese 20 millimeters in the cowl, that is when they stretched the fuselage and went to a fixed tail wheel. At some point later, there was an interceptor version of the Key 61s, primarily to deal with the B-29 threat. These had twin 12.7s in the cowl, and 30 millimeter cannons in the wings, but I think very few of those were built. So in firepower, most Tonys were pretty good. Normally two 12.7s, or again nominally 50 caliber, plus two 20 millimeter cannons. That's a pretty decent amount of firepower, enough to be competitive with Allied airplanes. Now I would rate the P-38 ahead on firepower because those four 50 cals it's packing they throw out a lot of ammo. 
and within a few hundred yards and at a right angle they can punch right through the Tony's armor or for that matter the armor of any World War II airplane yes including the IL-2 plus they were incendiary the, the ammunition was and would catch things on fire furthermore the 38 still has a 20 millimeter cannon so while both planes have pretty decent firepower I think the 38 has the edge here maneuverability goes to the Tony. This was one of its strong points. Now at high altitudes, say above 20,000 feet, the Tony's power drops off, so it won't be able to sustain steep climb angles or comparatively high rates of turn when you start going up above 20,000. But below that altitude, it's a very strong dogfighter. In a sustained turn, the Tony-1 can beat a P-38 Lightning, P-39 Era Cobra, P-40 Warhawk, Kitty Hawk, whatever, F-6F Hellcat, or F-4U Corsair. In regards to roll rate at dogfighting speeds, the Tony is decent. It's about equal to the Hellcat, not quite as good as the Corsair. At high speeds, the U.S. planes have the advantage in roll because the Tony's controls become uh, very heavy in, in the roll axis, typical of Japanese aircraft. The U.S. Navy tested a Tony-1 against just about everything in their inventory. Here is a chart from that report. I'm going to start by removing the F-7F Tiger Cat and the F-8F Bearcat for a few reasons. First of all, those planes did not see combat in the war. Plus, in this test, they were tested without being able to use combat power. Thus, their sustained turn rates are falsely low. Plus, I need to declutter this chart a bit. At the outside of the turn, we have the F-4U-1D Corsair. That's a good turning airplane but it's in with some very strong competition here. Next up is the F4U-4 Corsair. That was a late war version. Then we have the Hellcat. Now inside of the Hellcat's turn we have a tie between the Tony and the FM2 Wildcat. I have a whole video on the FM2. It's a Wildcat that's lightweight, has extra power, it has water methanol injection which helps it out a lot, and quite a few other improvements. It had the best sustained turn rate of any U.S. Army Air Force or U.S. Navy fighter that saw combat in the war in significant numbers. So the Tony outturns all of these airplanes except the FM-2, which it ties, and the Tony is much faster than the FM-2, so it has a large number of other advantages. While turn performance is a factor, and it's a big deal, especially in a one-versus-one dogfight, it is not the end-all, be-all performance statistic that rules the day. If it was, the U.S. Navy would have been putting FM-2s on every aircraft carrier, and the U.S. Army Air Force would have been building a lot of P-36s. It should be pointed out that from the point of view of the Japanese pilots, the Tony had terrible turn performance because they were comparing it to the Ki-43 Oscar or the A6M Zeros, and those planes would easily outturn the Tony. But overall, uh, as compared with the U.S. airplanes, the Tony had very good turn performance. And as compared with the P-38F or G model, the Tony-1 has good overall performance. It has a higher dive speed and it's more maneuverable. The P-38 was faster and had a better climb rate. Both planes have good armor protection and firepower. On paper, I'm going to have to say the P-38 has the edge overall, but it's pretty close. And the, 19, and the Tony was the only 1943 Japanese fighter that could really compete with the P-38. Um, but you have to ask, if performance was close, why didn't the Tonys do comparatively well in combat? Well, as usual, there are a lot of factors at play, more than just aircraft performance. According to U.S. intelligence, the Japanese had two major classifications of pilots during the war. These were called Division I and Division II, and these divisions were based on combat experience, initiative, and ability. Now, I want to stress this was not a difference in training. They all went through more or less the same training program. It was a difference exper in experience gained after flight training. Japanese flight training in World War II was extremely poor, probably the worst in the world. Physical abuse and intimidation were considered primary training methods. Everything you could do wrong setting up a flight training program, they did. The training programs, and not just the ones for pilots, uh, ones for soldiers on the ground, mechanics, all sorts of things, seemed to be more about the egos of the instructors than getting good results from the students. 
The end result was that pilots, once they got out of training, were just not that good. Thus, they needed time in the field to become good. Now, as you would expect, the Division I pilots, the ones that became good due to their greater level of experience, were significantly more effective than the Division II pilots. However, by 1943, not many Division I pilots were left. During the first five months of the war, the Japanese were losing about 400 airplanes a month. It's unclear how many pilot losses they had, but considering that the Japanese put almost no effort into search and rescue of downed pilots, it's reasonable to assume that the number of pilots lost in the Pacific wasn't too far behind the number of aircraft lost. The Japanese were able to train replacements fast enough to offset this, but that means that in many cases they were replacing a lost Division I pilot with a new Division II pilot who was poorly trained. Thus, by the time the Japanese went into battle flying Tonys in 1943, they had largely lost their advantage of having the more experienced pilot group, which they did have throughout most of 1942. In fact, this is a report from December of 1942. As we already see signs, uh, we already see signs that at this point they were starting to run out of Division I pilots. Also, Japanese Army pilots, and those of course are the ones that are going to be flying the Tony, were generally inferior to Japanese Navy pilots, which is another topic for another time, so let's stay on track. The U.S. Army Air Force did a post-war study of Japanese Army Air Force pilots and concluded that they began to decline in quality in early 1943, thus right about the time the Ki-61s were coming out of the scene. During 1942, typical Japanese Army Air Force pilots had between 300 and 500 hours of flying time, but that dropped to two to 300 during 1943 and down to about 200 hours by November of that year. Thus, for most of the time the Ki-61s were in combat, they were flown by pilots with significantly less experience and worse training than a typical U.S. Army Air Force or U.S. Navy pilot. That alone is a pretty big deal, but there were other factors that made this even worse for the Ki-61 pilots. At the start of the war in Europe, numerous air forces flew in what was called the Vic Formation. Three airplanes as you see them here. This looks nice, and it's a great formation for air shows, but in combat it's relatively poor because two of the pilots have to focus pretty hard on staying in the tight formation and not colliding with each other, Thus, they can't divert too much attention to the task of looking for enemy aircraft. Plus, these three airplanes are not in a good position to support each other defensively. The Germans were among the first to realize this problem, and they pioneered the use of the Finger Four formation. I don't want to turn this into a video on air-to-air -air tactics, but for fighters, the Finger Four was the way to go during World War II. Each wingman could support his leader, and each pair of airplanes could support the other. In other words, it was very hard to attack one of these planes without the other getting onto the attacker six. Furthermore, the planes were spaced far enough apart so they could keep a pretty good lookout for the enemy. This picture isn't to scale. They would normally be farther apart than what you see here. Now, the British abandoned that Vic formation and switched over to the Finger Four after the Battle of Britain. The U.S. Army Air Force and the U.S. Navy switched over around the same time, maybe slightly later. The Japanese, however, were very slow to adapt this. In fact, there were several times when U.S. pilots described Japanese formations as insect swarms because they seemed to have no discernible order to them. The truth is they did have an order, but to an outside observer it just looked like total chaos. The Japanese altered the standard Vic formation so that one plane would fly behind the leader off to one side a little bit above. The other would be on the opposite side a little bit below. Then the two wingmen would weave back and forth to more effectively search for enemy aircraft, and every now and then they would do a complete roll to really scan the area below the plane uh, more effectively. Now, this formation was called a shotai, and they could, of course, group as many of them together, and more shotai uh, together, you, get, you come up with different names for larger groups. Now, when you get a bunch of airplanes doing this, let's say 30 of them, it appears as if a third of them are flying straight and level, while the others are buzzing all around. Oh, and the Japanese also use an echelon formation at times, and that could be mixed into this. So it would really, really look like chaos, but there was a method to it. Now, the Shotai would attack by having the leader go in on the target, and the other two airplanes would follow, so that the airplane being attacked was hit by one plane after another after another. 
And even if the enemy airplane did a great brake turn and the first airplane missed, the next one was then still in a good position to hit, and so was the third. So this is a pretty decent offensive formation. It's just poor for defense. Eventually, they did go to a more finger four-like formation, but by then it was too late. Their pilot quality was going downhill, and their numerical inferiority had passed the point of no return. So why did the Japanese go with this modified Vic layout for so long? I think there were two main reasons. First, their airplanes had either no radios or radios that were so poor they were useless. Thus, Japanese fighter pilots were largely communicating with each other using hand signals. That would, to some extent, negate the effectiveness of the Finger 4 because it's going to be hard to coordinate two pairs of aircraft with hand signals. However, I think the main reason was that early in the war, and even to an extent later, Japanese tactics seemed to be very offense-oriented. When reading through U.S. and British intelligence reports, I run into example after example of very aggressive Japanese tactics. In this British report, Japanese defensive tactics are literally described as offensive. Later in the report, it's explained that the Japanese defensive go-to move is the counterattack. Going through report after report, it's almost always like this, except in cases in which the Japanese are being shelled from a position to which they cannot return fire. In that case, they dig in, and they were quite good at that. Now, this isn't intended to be a case study of Japanese tactics. I know someone's going to say, but, you know, what happened on Atu or whatever. My point is just that when compared with other militaries of the world, the Japanese were very offense-oriented, and I think that ideology was seen on air, sea, and land. And I should say, before this video, I read every single U.S. intelligence report that dealt with fighter aircraft uh, from the Pacific Theater during World War II. Now, I think that the Shotai formation suits this offensive ideology very well. When the leader goes into attack, normally all three members of the Shotai do as well. Nobody hangs back to defend the attacking airplanes and, you know, watch your leader sick, so to speak. It's all about the offense. It's all about getting ammunition on the target. Now, the problem, as you can imagine, is defense. When attacked, the Japanese fighters fought individually. Once the Shotai was broken up, they had no way to communicate with each other, and things usually degraded for them pretty fast as they could be picked off by U.S. fighters working in pairs, even if they were inferior U.S. fighters. Perhaps worse um, was the command and control of the Japanese fighters. I'm talking about the big picture command and control, not control of an individual squadron. As an example, Many of the Ki-61s were fighting from WIWAC on New Guinea. Here's a map of the area. The Ki-61s were primarily based at Rabaul and WIWAC, but were operated off other airfields in the area as well, but th those were the two main ones. The U.S. Army Air Force had P-38s based, based at Port Moresby and another airfield nearby that's not on this map. It was located about here. I'll put a circle there. When looking at this map, it appears that ground forces could just march across the island and take the enemy base. That's not the case. I have flown over this area, and I can tell you it is some of the most inhospitable terrain I've ever seen. There's a mountain range that runs the length of the island with peak elevations for a great distance, around 12,000 feet or more. There are numerous smaller mountain ranges, rivers, and some of the most dense jungle I've ever seen. Moving an army across land from Port Moresby to Wewak would involve so many mountain and river crossings and distance through near impenetrable jungle, at least impenetrable for any kind of a vehicle, that it's just not doable. It makes a lot more sense to get control of the sea and sail around or use air power. And of course, air power helps to control the sea. So the Japanese tried to establish air superiority via what seemed like essentially World War I methods. They would take off on patrols in hopes of encountering the enemy much like the dawn patrols of the First World War. They would just fly around looking for targets, and then when they're low on fuel, they would return to base. This was very inefficient. It put a lot of time on the planes, and it used up a lot of fuel, often for nothing. And time on the planes is a big factor here, because the Ki-61 was a maintenance hog. It was a very maintenance-intensive airplane, so much so that when the U.S. Navy examined one, they said, quote, from the experience encountered during the trials, it seems very likely that the Japanese find it difficult to keep the Tony in commission." Unquote. The U.S. Navy was exactly right. The Japanese 
did find it tough to keep those planes operating. Not only did they have uh, problems with a lack of well-trained pilots, they were short on mechanics, technicians, and parts. Plus, the plane was difficult to service. Although apparently it got better when they stretched the fuselage, they also made some changes at the time to improve serviceability. But that Navy report is on that stretched, improved version. So just by the nature of the way the Japanese were using the planes, the Tonys um, were spending unproductive time in the air, thus having to spend more time on the ground being repaired than they otherwise would have. Now to make matters worse, U.S. bombers and P-38 F and G models, if equipped with drop tanks, could easily reach Rabaul or Wewak. In fact, they could loiter a long time and go over there. Even without drop tanks, they could get close to those bases. Now, the Tony had much less range and could not effectively reach Port Moresby from Wewak or Rabaul. That's not to say that the Tony had poor range. It was much better in that regard than P-39, P-40, BF-109, BF or Spitfire. However, it wasn't as good as the P-38 in terms of range or the other Japanese fighters. And in the Pacific, that was a big drawback. So imagine how this fight is going to go. The U.S. forces detect a group of Tonys on radar. They can reach the P-38s by radio if they're already in the air and vector them towards the enemy for an attack. Plus, depending on their fuel status, the P-38s may be able to simply shadow the Tonys and hit them when they're low on fuel or landing. Even if the Tonys see the P-38s, they can't do much about it. They can't catch them. The P-38s can just wait until conditions favor them to attack. In fact, U.S. forces can simply time a bomber raid for when they're, they know the Tonys are going to be on the ground. Now, they maybe aren't exactly sure which base they're going to go to, but they can take a pretty good guess. So, once the Tonys are detected, figuring out when they're going to be back at the base and where is pretty simple math because the range and endurance of these planes is pretty well known. To me, this picture really represents the typical fate of Ki-61s. This shows a B-25 attacking an airfield near Wewak and catching the Tonys on the ground. Of course, the Japanese had radar as well, and pretty good ground-based radios. So you might think they could employ similar tactics against the Americans, but they couldn't, because without good radios in the planes, it just didn't mean that much that they had decent radar. You might see those B-25s on radar heading for your Japanese airfield, but if your fighters are in the air and low on fuel and heading back in, there isn't much you can do about it. And even if they're fat on fuel when you spot the B-25s on radar, there isn't much you can do about it because you can't radio the fighters. So the Ki-61s had a lot of things working against them here. Inexperienced pilots, they were flying with serious outdated tactics uh, that were very poor defensively. The, in the big picture, they had very poor command and control because once in the air, they couldn't be informed of enemy activity. And relied on what was essentially luck to find the enemy during their patrols. Of course, there was another problem. The Japanese Army Air Force pilots were not well trained, or I should say not well trained at all, in long range or overwater navigation. The Japanese were in a huge hurry to get those Ki-61s out there to New Guinea uh, because the Ki-43s were completely outclassed. So in their rush to do that, they lost a lot of planes trying to get them there. In one case, they lost 18 out of 30 planes in transit from truck to Rabaul. Now, once in New Guinea, the Ki-61 pilots often suffered what the U.S. pilots had to deal with during the Guadalcanal campaign in 1942. This time, it was the Japanese pilots who, due to supply line issues, were suffering from malaria and other Ill illnesses. In summary, the Ki-61-1 had pretty decent performance. It wasn't equal to the P-38, but it was the only Japanese airplane in 1943 that was at least in the same ballpark. In the right situation, it could do pretty well. In fact, at least a dozen Ki-61 pilots became aces in the plane, and many of their victories were over P-38s. However, more often than not, the plane wasn't in a good situation. Inexperienced pilots, disease, mechanical issues with the airplanes, that outdated formation, lack of command and control. It's really a mess, and it's no wonder that the P-38s and the U.S. Army Air Force in general wiped out the Japanese Army Air Force over New Guinea. There is one more thing I want to talk about. Um, I should have done this earlier in the video, but I, I just couldn't fit it in anywhere. This is the Ki-61's cockpit. It's so different from other World War II airplanes that I can't decide if I like it or not. It looks like, to me, like something from a Pulp Fiction sci-fi book from the 1930s. 
I haven't seen anything quite like those levers on the lower left. They control most of the big functions, landing gear, flaps, radiator shutters, uh, gun cocking that could be cocked from the cockpit, and so on. If someone makes a Pacific Theater flight sim, I really hope this plane is included. I really want to fly it in simulation. There's enough information on it to do it, although maybe just barely. The air war over New Guinea has been overlooked in the simulator world, but it's a really interesting aspect of the Pacific air war, and I think ideal for simulator action due to the interesting terrain, number of air bases, some of them in close proximity to another, uh, potential for naval involvement, and somewhat equal planes and numbers. Now, back to that cockpit, uh, this is what I actually wanted to show you. The turn and bank indicator here is mounted very up high, uh, very high up on the instrument panel in the Key 61. In fact, it's this way in most Japanese fighters. Now, in most fighters from other nations, with a few exceptions, it's usually mounted pretty far down on the instrument panel. But I think the Japanese were onto something here. Let's put up a generic picture of this type of gauge so we can see it a little bit better. The vertical needle there moves left and right, pivots at the bottom and it indicates rate of turn and direction. So if it goes to the left, the farther it goes to the left, the greater your rate of turn to the left is. It's a gyro instrument primarily there for instrument flying conditions, meaning flying through the clouds or areas of low visibility. Now below the needle is the ball, with that portion is called the inclinometer. The ball moves left and right, and if it moves to the left you need more left rudder, if it moves to the right you need more right rudder it should be in the center for optimal performance and for accurate gunnery. I think having that gauge up high near the windscreen is a really good idea because if you're in a really tough turning turning fight, you don't want to have to take your eyes off the opponent for very long to check this thing. And keeping that ball in the center is a big deal. Turn rate, speed, climb performance, it'll all suffer if you don't keep that ball in the center. Also, if the ball isn't centered up, your gun sight doesn't do you much good because it assumes the plane is not in a slip or a skid. In other words, your gun sight assumes that ball is in the center. In fact, I think in Robert Stanford Tuck's book, Fly for Your Life, very good book, um, I think he talked about this specifically, but it's been a few decades since I read that, so I, I could be wrong. But I'm not wrong about the fact that this matters. And having it near the gun sight so the pilot can make quick checks of this without taking his eyes off the target uh, for very long is a great thing when you're in combat and it's rarely seen on anything other than Japanese World War II fighters. Now, if you had a gyro gun sight, this becomes even more critical. Now, I don't know if the Key 61 ever had a gyro gun sight. There are pictures which show what appears to be a Venturi tube located on the left side of the fuselage. These are normally used to create suction to move air to drive a, a vacuum or air-driven gyro. Um, some say that that's for a gyro gun sight. I have two things to say about that. First, vacuum gyros are used for other things as well, like gyro instruments. So the presence of one of these does not automatically mean a gyro sight is installed. Second, this picture and the very few others that seem to show this are so blurry that I'm not even sure that is a Venturi tube. Uh, thanks to all my subscribers, especially my Patreon supporters, they specifically voted for this Key 61 video to get moved up to the front of the line. It's been on the back burner for about a year because I didn't think there would be much interest in it. I've wanted to do a video on a Japanese plane for a while. I just didn't want it to be the Zero, but I do want to do the Zero eventually, but not for the first one. And I wasn't sure there'd be much interest in the other stuff from Japan, so I'm actually really anxious to see how this video does. I chose the Key 61 simply because it's the only 1943 airplane that had a reasonable chance against the U.S. Army Air Force at that point. And by 1944, of course, there are better Japanese airplanes, but by that point, the course of the war had been determined. So for me, 1943 is kind of the most interesting time to look at. So um, I wanted to cover the Key 61. My Patreon supporters wanted it, and they keep this channel moving forward. I appreciate every one of you, and I hope you like this video. If it goes well, I'll add more planes into the rotation. Uh, perhaps a Key 61-2. That one, of course, has the Japanese version of the Daimler-Benz CB605, and it's a pretty interesting airplane. Um, maybe the Key 100 or who knows what. That's all for now, and have a great day. Oh, and uh, wait, really quickly, before I go, I want to uh, let you know what happened with those two designers we talked about. After he went back to Germany, Richard Vaught,
eventually became the chief designer for Blom and Voss, and he designed some really weird stuff. A lot of airplanes that you've seen, but maybe didn't know uh, the connection between uh, those airplanes and the Key 61. Now, after the war, Richard Voss, uh, Richard Vaught rather, was swept up in Operation Paperclip. He ended up uh, living in America and worked for Boeing, where I believe he retired and lived to a ripe old age. After the Japanese surrender, aviation in Japan was severely curtailed, much like in Germany after the First World War. Takeo Doi worked a number of odd jobs because he couldn't work in aviation anymore before he got back into aircraft design. His most famous post-war design was the YS-11 turboprop, which was one of the most famous Japanese airplanes of the 1950s. Goodbye, and have a great day.